Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be here and to meet you here virtually. And I thank Figma for giving me this opportunity to speak in my very first conference. I'm Shelley, a product designer based in Singapore. Today, I will be speaking about unintended consequences, tech ethics, and how we as designers can be part of the solution. We'll also look at how we can empower our colleagues to be part of it as well in an accessible and actionable way. A little intro about myself. I'm working in Rakuten Viki, a video streaming product where I design content, uh, content discovery features like search, filters, and recommendations. I love plants, um, and as Louis spoke about it just now, I really love to solve problems as well on bouldering walls. I spent seven months of my time late last year and earlier this year researching and experimenting on the topics of ethics, value-sensitive design, and organization change for my master's. It's only a small drop in the ocean of tech ethics research, but I'm excited to share what I've learned with you and to hear what you have to say about this topic. So first, I want to start this talk with a trigger warning because the story that I'm going to tell now is not a happy one. So imagine that you have found this investment app called Robinhood, and any newcomer can use it to invest easily. The app gamifies the experience, and when you do put your money on some stocks, Robinhood flashes you confetti. I want to introduce you to Alex. Alex was 20, and he was one of the 3 million people who opened an account on Robinhood since COVID-19 started. So I got consent to share this story and this screenshot from Alex's family. This was what Alex saw on June 12, 2020 in his Robinhood app. He saw that he was in a debt of $700,000. The app did not tell him that this was just temporary while waiting for stocks to be credited to his account. So he thought his life was over and he killed himself. I am sharing Alex's story because we are all working with technology here. And this is at the minimum a UX and UI issue, and any tech maker should be responsible for this kind of failures. We all know that technology advances change the world, and it affects all aspects of life because of how connected the world is now. Technology has indeed helped us in so many ways, allowing us to eat really well right in the comfort of our own home, meet strangers easily, and we can connect with our friends and family, even if they are far away. But technology is a neutral because it has the ability to change how society functions and shape people's relationships, identities, and the way they behave. So now we are really used to people delivering food to us through bad weather and bad traffic. We swipe people left and right, like they are disposable. And we are addicted to Facebook or Instagram because it fulfills basic human instincts like envy. And we have seen so many articles like this, all about how usage of technology has made lives worse. Unfortunately, design is also not neutral, just like technology isn't. And to design is to create change while imparting our values or our organization's values into the world. All artifacts that we design comes with some form of intention. We direct users to spend their time, money, and attention in a certain way. And we decide how people should feel and behave. I'm sure we have all heard about dark patterns, right? And for this instance, what we are looking at right now 
it is clear that we can make our users feel really terrible using only words. And it might not feel like it to you, but what we do now has increasing reach in the world. The last I checked, 3.9 million Uber users, or rather drivers, see this little model daily. A gamification technique gets drivers to stay on the app longer and drive more. Obviously, this is really good for Uber's business, but it is risky to drivers' health. As designers, we are both part of the solution and part of the problem. We are the people who ideate new ideas and direct them to be implemented. Most of the time, we are the gatekeepers before an idea gets developed and released. So, we've, so with all this power we have, it is now not enough for us to claim that we built with good intentions, but if faced with unintended consequences, dismiss them as we are just doing our jobs. So I want to challenge ourselves as an industry. Currently, the industry views us, views a good UX designer as someone who can fulfill user needs, attain business goals, and design with technical constraints in mind. I want to propose that designers should be something more. We can add one more ingredient into our skill set. We can help to design ethical tech. Dan Zolman, a senior UX practitioner, states that designers are in a unique position to facilitate dialogue about ethics because we can bring our teams together. We often bring in all voices to reflect, discuss, and wrestle with difficult questions. And we already have all this in us. We have this facilitation, communication, alignment skills that we use daily in our work. We can use these same skills to address ethical issues and bring our teams through it together. So perhaps now you might be thinking, all right, I'm utterly convinced um, and I need some solutions. How can I design ethical tech and what should I do? So tech leaders have proposed some solutions. Maybe we should set up a designer code of ethics, like a Hippocratic, Hippocratic oath for designers or tech makers. We should regulate the tech industry and we should have some sort of certification for designers to confirm that we have a certain level of expertise or even technical ethical abilities. And all of these are good to have, but we also have to recognize that there are limitations. A code of ethics is static and usually don't change, doesn't change. And regulation is great, but we cannot depend on it because it might not catch up to technological advances. And this is a difficult topic to tackle because ethics is fluid in any given situation. By these, I mean that ethics can evolve and change due to caste, constraints, context, and culture. So how can this look like when working on a project? When we talk about caste, we are talking about people in our teams. And people have different value systems due to their upbringing and what they have experienced or where they are brought up. In your working teams, each of your teammates may view each human value differently, mainly with only small differences. And when you switch to work with another group of colleagues, the, dy the dynamic would change again. Constraints. You might be someone working in a client-designer relationship, or you might be someone uh, who is a product designer in a product company. In a client-designer relationship, it might be very difficult for you to override client decisions. Your project will then take on the ethical principles of your client. If you are someone privileged and in a majority, 
it might be easier for you to speak up for what you value. However, if you're someone who is underrepresented, you might not want to speak up in a project due to potential repercussions. A project might then take on the ethical principles of the person who has the loudest voice. Lastly, different cultures would perceive the importance of human values differently. Take the idea of freedom, for instance. For someone like me, who has grown up in Singapore since, since the age of five, freedom to me means being able to walk the streets safely at 3 a.m. in the morning. For you, who is watching now in wherever you are, I'm sure your view of freedom would be very, very different from mine. Because ethics is fluid, it needs to be treated accordingly like a living document and conversation. We cannot be too prescriptive with our solutions, but we will need skills and tools that can embrace this kind of fluidity. Shannon Veller, a researcher and professor of philosophy, urges us to develop ethical wisdom and agility. This enables us to gain a kind of flexibility to know that a certain virtue isn't the only or right virtue for all situations. There are two parts to developing ethic, ethical agility, ethical thinking and developing an ethical practice. First off, how can we develop ethical thinking? Ethical thinking is the combination of skills and processes that will allow us to think through ethical choices and scenarios. We can start with ourselves and discover what our ethical position is. On the right are three modern lenses which you can view ethics through. Utilitarianism, deontology, and virtue ethics. Do you determine right from wrong by focusing on the best outcome? That's ut utilitarianism. If you use a set of rules to gauge right from wrong rather than consequences, that's deontology. And if you are more interested in the virtue or moral character of a person, then you are inclined to virtue ethics. Knowing your ethical posi position will allow you to reflect on your personal actions. And if you know these three lenses well, you can practice switching them and looking through different perspectives. Learning systems thinking would also allow us to interpret, analyze, prioritize, and identify any biases in our work, allowing us to reason and reflect. One, one such systems tool is the iceberg tool. We can use it to look past events and trends and dive deeper into underlying structures and mental models in the systems we live in. The second part of ethical agility is developing an ethical design practice. Industry experts like Eric Mayer and Sarah Wat Waterbacher in their book, Design for Real Life, recommend inserting methods, methods that will allow tech makers to build their own daily ethical practice. And these methods include rethinking and challenging our own and our team's vision and assumptions with a designated dissenter a team member who pokes holes in a team's decisions. We can also use pre-mortem questioning to gain awareness about personal bias by imagining the end result before something gets built. We can incorporate stress cases in the user journey and use imperfect personas to highlight the stress cases. Kenneth Bowles, author of the book Future Ethics, which I highly, highly recommend, also listed concrete ways to build ethical thinking and action throughout our design thinking process. So in a design, in a design phase, we could design with visibility. We could materialize things like data flows so that users would know what has happened with the data 
or how shared apps have been used by others. In a prototyping phase, we can use provocotypes. Prototypes meant to provoke, to visualize, and uncover unintended consequences and potential features. Finally, in a testing phase, we could invite the general public, not only unintended users, to test products. Processes like these are meant to unbiased and have tech makers think widely beyond the product they are designing and guide them to better outcomes. What can you do to lead your teams to ethical agility after you have developed yours? Porras and Robertson's model of organization change argues that persistent change in organization culture can be achieved through the individual's change in behavior. So whether or not you are an individual contributor or a manager, the best way to encourage ethical agility in your teams is to lead by setting good examples, question and voice out any concerns, and highlight ethical decisions. If you are lucky enough to be in a situation where you can speak up, do try it out. And here are some tools you can use to facilitate ethical conversations with your teams. There are various checklists, toolkits, frameworks, and games that the industry has designed for this very purpose. Here's, this, here's the ethical OS, consisting of eight risk areas and 14 scenarios to help you spark conversations and future-proof technology. Tools also veer into speculative design, speculative design like Casey Fleiss's Black Mirror exercises that she has done for a class. She gets a student to imagine the kind of regulations that should exist if the world is run by robots. A tool that inspired me was the tarot cards of tech. You use the prompt cards to imagine technology in different states. Like if they are highly successful, or if they are misused. Microsoft's Judgment Call, the game, was also a huge inspiration for me. It's a card game that combines systems thinking with Microsoft's ethical AI principles and asks participants to imagine writing a one to five star review for when AI was used. You might realize that a lot of tools are games or have a gaming element. So why are games so popular? Research has suggested that a game is a good mode to teach ethics and foster ethical think thinking, whether or not they are digital or analog. Karen Schreier, an ethics education and video games researcher, elaborates that games allow players to personify new identities, see from a different perspective, and explore the consequences of their actions. Role-playing games also encourage empathy and effect change. While researching all current tools, I realized that something was missing. There is an assumption that a facilitator using ethical tools works in a culture that encourages open conversations about the impacts of technology. That is not necessarily true for some designers. What if there are no venues for you to voice out concerns? And what if you are a junior designer and you feel like you don't have the agency to voice out your concerns? And finally, in some cultures or countries, speaking up is really not the norm. So what can we do then for these designers who want to create change but find it difficult to do so? This is where a game I design called The Dexinated Dissenter comes in. It is inspired by the book Design for Real Life, which I mentioned earlier in this talk. This card deck can be used as a strategic facilitation tool to get your teams to think about the larger consequences of what you're building. Or you could use it as a way to help your team think in a more systemic way. Finally, it is a way to get to know your team better and foster an open feedback culture, 
where important conversations about the impact of tech can take place. There are three elements to this game, stakeholders, values, and the discussion that would take place. The stakeholder cards encourage participants to think about how technology would affect the entire ecosystem it lives in. This ranges from the public, policymakers, direct and indirect users to the designated dissenter. The designated dissenter is the person who has the sole duty of dissenting against ideas that that team has come up with. There are also 10 value cards in this game representing the 10 important human values that will get affected by technology. These values were picked based on research by Bayard Friedman, who pioneered value sensitive design to account for human values while designing for technology. Some examples of human values will be privacy, safety, and freedom from bias. To play, the team picks a technology, service or feature, and they pick a human value. The designated dissenter writes the worst unintended consequences the technology could have on that human value. And the rest of the stakeholders will write the best impact the usage of that technology can have. Through industry workshops with my colleagues at Viki and with the wider industry, I discovered that this designated dissenter card was crucial to empower even the most junior of designers or quiet folks to amplify their concerns. People could use this chance to speak up because it was within the rules of the game. The discussion that happened in each round was also fascinating and encouraging to me. Ethical reasoning and exploration was exactly what I wanted to achieve with a game like this. I urge you to try this out with your teams. Remix the cards to fit your purpose. So one thought I had while designing these cards was that the value cards were based on Western-centric research of human values. Maybe you have a strong sense that in your company or teams, other human values will be more important than what was provided in the deck. You can find a designated dissenter right now in the Figma community. You can choose to print out the physical de deck or go wild on the digital game board. Finally, it would be realistic for us to also think about the challenges that we will be facing when trying to advocate for ethical tech. This is a systemic issue and we can't fix it by ourselves. What is on the opposing end are systemic forces at play, social, cultural, political forces that are much bigger than an individual or collective's action. But I truly believe that change happens when continuous work is done in parallel. I will leave you with an example of how an individual can start a movement. The climate change, the climate change protest, which started with the Greta Thunberg, has manifested into a worldwide movement and into collective action. Making small steps and recognizing that more work needs more work needs to be done is way better than holding back for fear of not doing enough. So let's get to work. Thank you.